morning, good afternoon. Hi, it's Stephen, it's Morgan. Morgan, how are you? Mari, how are you doing? Good, it's great to meet you, sir. Yes, you too. Uh, thank you very much for doing this interview. Yeah, so, I am. I'm. I'm thrilled to uh, to find out about your to about your space and to to talk to you. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm part of the the program I told you about. It's for people with uh, various kinds of disabilities. I have what's called an invisible disability, which is uh, mental health. And uh, so we're we're all learning about broadcasting, and I have my own podcast, and this is part of. A part of the program, interviewing people who are already out in the field doing it. That's fantastic. All right, so first of all, what I'm going to ask you is, uh, were you involved in traditional broadcasting in any form before you got into podcasting, like terrestrial radio or something like that? Uh, only in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> only in my dreams. It was. Uh, uh, I fell in love with radio when I was in grade four. And I hung around some radio stations and some recording studios. But when it came time to go to radio college, uh, my parents insisted that I go to a, a, a real university. So Ryerson at the time was not a university. It was a polytechnic institute. All right. What inspired you to start your podcast? Well, actually, I, I have a radio station. I have an Internet-based radio station. Uh, so we play, uh, we now have 80 podcasts that we play here. But what inspired me to begin this project is uh, I was, uh, first of all, that love of radio, but also uh, I was very frustrated uh, having been an educator for 30 years and working in schools. Uh, I was frustrated by some of the polarization in the conversations that was going on. So I figured if I could create a space where people could come and create content do live broadcasting and uh, podcasts that we might be able to deepen and broaden those conversations that we have about education in Canada and around the world. And as a listener, what, what do you find podcasts have to offer that you don't find in terrestrial radio? Well, I think there's a depth uh, that that uh, is there in, in commercial radio. Uh, you know, talk radio, I guess, would be the closest to it. Uh, the, there's a there's a need to uh, answer to advertisers, and it, just when you're getting into the content, uh, they break away to commercial. Uh, even on public broadcasting like CBC, uh, the segments tend to be tend to be shorter than I like. So I think I think podcasting allows people to get into topics in depth and and uh, listen at their leisure. And do you think it's possible one day that podcasts will one will become competitive? with terrestrial and satellite radio to the point where they may surpass those mediums in popularity and profitability? I think if you look at the signals that are out there, Morgan, I think you'll, you would have to agree, yeah, that's good. And I don't think it's going to be that far, uh, far off, actually. And remarks that have been made by public figures and podcasts have been reported in mainstream media. I don't know if you ever heard about the incident involving Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, who made a, a, a remark on Joe Rogan's podcast about uh, pedophilia and how he felt uh, that it's possible that uh, that kind of transaction need not be child abuse, but it destroyed his career. Um, so ultimately he underestimated the reach and power of podcasts. Do you think there could be more incidents like that in the future where oh, we yeah. see the breadth and scope of the influence of podcasts? I think I think there could be, and and uh, because uh, well, we see the same thing in social media happening that uh, you know one tweet can bring someone down. So, uh, podcasts like social media posts are there uh, forever because uh, even if you take it down, someone may have already uh, recorded it and uh, kept it. So yes, I I think that we. I think there's a sense of responsibility that needs to to be there when people are producing podcasts and, and understanding that um, they're producing content that that is public. And what kind of podcast do you tend to gravitate toward as a listener? Well, I like uh, I like listening obviously to, to education podcasts, uh, but I I also like uh, listening to philosophy and uh, psychology podcasts uh, and a little bit of world history, a little bit of um, music history as well. And is there one particular podcast that you would consider your favorite? <laughs> that's that's a difficult question. 
question because I spend most of my day editing other people's podcasts, and I don't think I have a favorite. I uh, I love I love this American life. I guess that's the one that uh, I, I would say that is closest to to me. And, uh, you know, there's a dark side to the freedom of speech that comes with podcasting. It's the Wild West. Anyone can start one. But then you have people like white supremacists, for instance, who uh, spread messages of hate. So do you feel that, uh, even though it's probably not possible, do you feel some degree, some amount of censorship should be introduced? Uh, that's a great question. I think that I think that we've kind of gone... Well, I think we need to really revisit the, the free speech, what we mean by free speech and what we mean by censorship. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we need a, a whole layer of censorship on podcasts. I think it is the Wild West. I think they're, uh, we're in a new renaissance, as, as uh, some authors will say. Uh, the, um, I'm trying to think of the author that I read that inspired me to start Voice Ed Radio. Uh, but it, the comment was made that you know, in a Renaissance period, the the line between the creator and the audience is blurred, and I think that's what we're finding now. And I think it's going to be a while before we we really get a handle on controlling this content. I I think it's it's a it's a really it's an it's an art form. I think it's a, and you wouldn't want to necessarily censor art, or maybe you would. Yeah. <laughs> And if if you get a choice, all things being equal, between podcasting and a show on terrestrial radio, and if if you could have the same uh, size of audience, and if, if the money was the same, uh, which one would you choose? Well, I like uh, I like the, the podcasting, and in our case, we we uh, we run a, a live radio stream as well. Uh, I like that because it gives access to more people. Uh, you can do it physically from your own home or your office or out on the street. And it just gives a sense of accessibility to the medium uh, that we, we've never seen before. And uh, one, one challenge that can emerge, uh, I know I've faced this, faced this with my own podcast and with your uh your streaming radio station as well, raising awareness of it, and there are options like social media. Uh, what, what challenges have you faced in terms of bringing, uh, you know, attracting people's attention to these shows? I guess, uh, you, you know, you hit on social media, and that's where most of our advertising for not only the live stream uh, shows, but also the, uh, the, the archive podcasts happens. Uh, and in education, uh, most of the people that I follow on Twitter, for example, are educators, but most of the educators in Canada aren't on social media. So we have to look for other ways of getting the word out there uh, and, and getting it out there in a, in a powerful way. Uh, it's, we're, we're, I think in the first two years of existence, we've lived under the false impression that just because we're on social media means that everybody knows about us, and very few people do know about us, so that's a challenge. I interviewed the radio personality Erin Davis the other day, and uh, we were talking about how when she started at the station CHFI in 1988, 30 years ago, uh, the media landscape has changed in dramatic ways. We have the internet now, we have satellite radio, podcasts, uh, social media, the internet, and 24-hour news stations. Um, so there's just, there's just so much media now. Do you feel we're oversaturated? Do you think it's just become it, like it's just cluttered up the, the the landscape of culture, so to speak? Well, you know that's that's an excellent question, and I think a, a, a longer a response and conversation is probably needed. But I think yes. On one hand, we have uh, you know when you look at our young people and even our older people, uh, it's possible to be on a device and connected at all times. And I think we've um, we've lost sight of just how much time we are consuming, and uh, to the point where the silence is uncomfortable for some people. So I think yes, I think culturally uh, we're crammed with uh, information, and we have very little time to think for ourselves. I think that's a concern. And how do you think traditional media holds up to uh, the 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 digital media now, the internet-based 
in terms of people getting so much of their news from social media sites and uh, the internet websites where some of it may be fake news and some of it may be highly biased. Uh, do, you, do you feel mainstream media is, is competing with it effectively enough? I I think they're at a loss to you know in terms of how to deal with it. I I also as a as a lover of news and lover of information uh, feel at a, at a loss. I lament the fact that uh, we are losing ground in our mainstream media to blogs and social media. Now I blog and I'm on social media, so I'm, I'm sort of shooting myself in the foot. But I think we have to step back and say, okay. We, where, where are our trained journal, journalists? Where are our long-form journalists that are going to allow us to dig into it? Uh, and where is the sense of attention uh, to these pieces? So they're still being written, but when we can get a news story in 30 seconds or less uh, on a 24-hour news cycle, are we attracted to sitting down on a Saturday or a Sunday and uh, spending time with a, a newspaper or a magazine? And I, I think, I think our democracy. It's, I don't want to say uh, sound alarmist and say our democracy is at stake, but I think uh, a strong democracy requires um, a, a strong uh, journalistic uh, tradition, and I think we may be losing sight of that. Yeah, and when you consider that our politicians are in democratic countries are now saying that the media is the enemy of the people, it seems like yeah. we need to protect that more than ever. Yeah, I think we need some some long, hard conversations about this. I don't, I don't think we can gloss over it. That you, You've raised some really excellent points, and I think we need to pay attention to them. Well, th I thank you very much today for this interview. It's been very enlightening, and I ver appreciate it very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you.